the last couple of decades I've been asking this question. Um, so I've been posing it for myself, but I'm, I'm posing it to you today as well. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Shereen Mitchell. I am known online as Digital Assista. Um, my first computer is the one that you're looking at right here, Commodore 64. My first game <laughs> is this one. Um, and so I, I just am showing my age a little bit because I'm basically saying I've been doing tech and been playing video games and the like since I was a child. Um, for me, um, growing up uh, as a woman of color, uh, as a girl of color in the projects of New York City, uh, it was not common to find a girl like me. Um, and I was always sort of the outsider no matter where I went, um, whether it was in school, whether it was at home. Um, so these are, the, these are the tools that my mother got for me because she wanted me to come home after school instead of going to the arcade room. And the store owner at the arcade room wanted me to go home too because I was beating everybody with a quarter playing Pac-Man and all the boys didn't want to come and play anymore because they didn't want to be beat by a girl. So <laughs> I uh, ended up going home and uh, my mother bought the first computer uh, for me, which was this one, and then the rest is basically history. Um, I, I'm a serial founder. I started with the first web firm, which is MHG, which is the, uh, the first woman of color web firm in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, after that, I discovered that there was a problem about gender and technology. Um, how, you know, how did I discover that? Well, we, we started doing surveys, but most importantly, people coming to me and coming to our uh, training programs, it became very clear that there was a bias and issues that needed to be addressed. So I then founded the first organization called Digital Sisters to ever consider issues for women of color in the tech industry. Fifteen years later, it's like, Everybody wants to talk about it. Um, it's, it's always interesting to me because uh, back then they told me I was crazy to even consider it, that this was not even something that we should be talking about because even when I checked the box to you know, become a computer programmer, I was told, not for you. You can go, you know, you can play games with it, but you're probably not going to get a job. Um, and since then, I have founded um, another organization because I am crazy like that. Um, called Stop Online Violence Against Women. And the reason why I formed this project was because what I had to do with Digital Sisters was to teach moms to prepare their daughters. And they were so afraid of online predators and threats that they would constantly unplug their daughters. I promised them then that their children would be fine. Well, look at what's happening today. That's actually not true. So I'm going to talk a little bit about online harassment, what's happening. I am going to show um, images of threats and threats of violence against people. Um, but I'm also going to talk about what are some of our solutions and what can we do next. Again, if um, any situation feels uncomfortable, please, please um, feel free to leave the room. Um, when we think about wh where we came from, for, for me, it was the first BBS board that I got on was the first time I was attacked online. So I'm using this um, spectrum of where we started to where we are. Um, but as you can tell, when, we, when, we, when AOL came about, um, that for me was like the biggest, you know, that, that was the next big thing. It's amazing because now AOL, most people are like, where, who's AOL? Where, you know, I think it's a content company. And it, and it of course wasn't. Um, but when you look at this full spectrum, you'll see how we've transitioned, that commerce became a big deal, and then we started getting back into sort of the social aspect of online, on being online and using tech. So when you come back around to the social network, you realize that we've, we sort of did a full circle. Um, and, and I always feel that when it comes to tech, we will always be operating in some form of circle. We either will be um, what I classify as um, open networks or closed networks. And for example, when I use this example now, I use Twitter as the example, because Twitter is open unless, you, unless your account is private. But Facebook and others, you have to you know, be connected to people. So it is usually people you know. Um, with Twitter, um, a lot of times, as, as was mentioned earlier, you don't know those people. You don't know where they're coming from. They're just engaging in the conversation with you. And I found it very interesting because when I started, um, it, was, it was very anonymous. You didn't know who those people were, and you didn't have their full names. 
now people are harassing and saying threatening things with their full identity, their jobs listed. It is, it is, it's mind boggling to me sometimes because it just feels like we're at this place where um, what people were thinking or what they would say privately in their own small groups, they're willing to say anywhere. And it, they actually don't care as much anymore about the consequences. And I think there's a reason for that. When we think about it, from a diversity perspective, this is sort of a spectrum of the tech companies from a leadership perspective. And as you can see, far, let's see, my, I'm looking at here left. So if you look over here to your far left, um, you'll notice that the diversity numbers are small. People who identify as multiracial, Hawaiian, African American, American Indian, Hispanic, Black, Asian are all in the same corner under 10%. However, when you look on the other end, you'll see that the, these companies are mostly predominantly white with all the green. That tells us something. That tells us that what's happening at these companies, their designs, the, the way they're thinking about engaging um, with, with the communities and the users, there's a bias there. There's a clear bias there because the numbers are so small. And the same with gender. Sorry. Drastic numbers. The one thing that we don't do is really look at the overlap. What we're looking at in these two different um, infographics is one says race and the other one says gender. But we actually are looking at the numbers between the combination of, the, of both of them. We know that there's 2% uh, African American or Asian or, I mean, not Asian, or Hispanic um, in, these, in these companies, but we don't know what those numbers are even per, for gender. Um, but as you can see, it's still predominantly white and men, or those who identify as men. And I just wanted to be clear that these infographics are a reflection of gender and race data, but they don't include sexual orientation, which we know that if you start to include any of the intersectional layers, it becomes a little bit more complicated and a little bit more, it's a community that becomes a little bit more marginalized and their voices aren't heard in those same rooms when those decisions are being made. So around 2010, this is shortly after the, the boom and you know, bust of 08 of the economy. Social media was thought of as this, this uh, even playing field, that somehow we would all come together, get to understand each other, reach out to people we've never seen before, talked to before, that at some point we would get to the end of you know, race and gender dis you know, distinctions. How do we do? <laughs> <laughs> It was very interesting because I remember several of my colleagues saying, this is going to be the way in which we start to understand each other. We get to talk to each other when we're miles apart. We get to talk to each other about the things that are important to us for our families, and we get to share that online. How are we doing? We're sharing. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think we're understanding each other very well. Um, when you, when you even look at some of the different, and, I, and I use, I'm using this, this graphic, but if you look at some of the different lo, um, social networks, for example, Pinterest is basically mostly women and mostly rural women. However, there is a, a different group that's showing up, but we do know that when it comes to it, there's this particular, if you want to go to Pinterest, nine times out of ten, if you're trying to reach rural white women, Pinterest is the place to go. Believe it or not, yeah, you may believe it, um, with everything with uh, Black Lives Matter and, and the like. Twitter is, is predominantly women, but actually predominantly African-American women. Facebook is mostly women as well, 70, 70, roughly around 70%. So the truth is, despite the fact that we were told that you know, maybe social media help us blend in all these dynamics of our gender and our race, the truth is, we still congregate as humans to certain places that we feel comfortable about. So naturally, 
nothing for us has changed despite the technology changing. What do you think? Will we move past stereotypes? Do we have the capacity? Will we be able to escape our demographics? That would be great if we can get there, right? Because the difference that we see right now is that lack of understanding, and that lack of understanding is turning into very hateful. Um, I, 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 I'm shocked sometimes at some of the things I see. Um, I'm shocked sometimes some of the things that people come to me about to try to help them. And it's, it's shocking mostly because you realize these are other human beings but for some reason, they don't see other people as also human beings, that they think they're other than. Um, and so when we look at some of the really ugly things that happen, one of the next steps in that, that we started talking about this was when uh, Amanda Hess did this article about why women aren't um, welcome on the internet. This was around 2014. So we went from 2010 saying social media was going to save us, and about four years later, we're going, no, that's not working out. And then we started talking about the rape threats, the death, the death threats that were, that's happening. My time is slow. And I'm just going to show a few here. Um, just the other day, this, this teacher literally basically told this young girl who was um, doing a campaign for books because she wanted to see more books like her, that she should just go look at the news so she could see all the black people being shot. Um, during the Cecil the Lion situation, this guy decided to use this as his, oh, I, I'm participating in this thought bubble about Cecil the Lion. During... Um, the controversy on, on um, Missouri's campus. Um, not only were yik yaks that were anonymous being sent with rape, rape threats and race threats, um, people's locations were being given out. And this young woman was using yik yak to try to get help because she was actually physically being attacked and being cornered on campus. So for me, when I look at this, I go, how is this possible? Sorry, let's go back. I'm trying to rush through this. Even when someone tries to help, there's another threat. Do you want to be next? And then finally, you have to see where you cannot take it anymore and you need to call the police. So how can we, <clears throat> is it possible? It actually depends, and the reason is because we do need police to really understand that social media is not this thing that you could just close your computer or get off your phone. Lawmakers need to use the existing laws to support what's happening because the truth is death threats for sure are not uh, freedom of speech, but we're not acting on them. Tech companies need diversity, not just because of the sake of diversity, but because a lot of times, these things that were happening, for example, on Twitter, that now Twitter knows they have a problem, they didn't have enough people around that realized things were escalating before it got to where it is today. So we need more people in these organizations to really think about what diversity, what, what issues look like threats to certain people depending on diversity. And then I always try to make sure that we have this conversation about, you know, no matter what the technology is, it's, it's us. It's the technology is built by us. It is us that's using it. So there is no tech fix for human behavior. There will be no tech savior. It is up to us to make those necessary changes. I'm not going to play the video because I want to make sure that um, people get a chance to ask the question. But if, if I know we don't have a lot of time, but one or two questions, if anyone has any. I have seven minutes? Oh, I have plenty of time. I'm sorry. Okay, I had a question.
question. You, you said you mentioned that um, it feels like now people seem more more likely to make these threats with their full information known. You said there's a reason for that. What, what do you think the reason is? Because the reason is that what I just what I, I'm gonna go back to the slide. It's the accountability part. Because they don't think, for example, Yik Yak was anonymous, until those students were told that the police were going to use Yik Yak to determine who's, who, who's um, committing the threats and who's um, instigating or you know, putting people in imminent danger, they didn't think they, they, they were going to get in trouble. So they didn't say anything. But when they found out that the police were going to use it, they were like, oh, bummer. The police can use this to find out where we are. So what I'm saying is the reason is this, because it's so prevalent and because people think that they will not be held accountable for their actions and that this is just something that happens to everybody. The amount of responses I hear that says, you know, everybody gets death threats. <laughs> no. No, everybody does not get death threats. Death threats is not a norm. And, and, and death threats is illegal. You can't do it to me in my face. So you can't do it to me online either. However, the police aren't taking the actions. And many times, they don't know what, you know, they need to be educated because they don't know what to, how to respond. The other problem is, depending on what the platform is, um, it could be a state issue. One state will tell you to go to one county. Another state will go, tell you to go to a different county. At the, by, by the time they finally catch up, you could be dead. And then possibly have to go up to the federal government. So the challenge that we have right now is, is the lack of accountability. The other thing that people don't realize is that once you have built something that you've given people full range and access, then you say, oops, no, we got to take some of that access back. Then they fight for it. Why? Because they were given a privilege, and now you're taking it back. So that's what we're seeing now, too. There is a huge amount of pushback because people feel like things are being taken away from them, things that they already had the right to. And much of the conversation that's happened online is, was not things that they should have had the right to say in the first place. And they would not have done it if they were being held accountable. Any other questions? Do you have any examples of a person who attacked someone online was held accountable and actually apologized in a meaningful way. Or any other kind of example of some small point of hope? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so one example is Lindy West, um, the guy who, she did an article about that particular situation, the guy who actually put up a, a profile of her dead father and said some really nasty things about her. He turned around and apologized. And he actually said, he, you know, he did apologize. The, the challenge is, is that even the, the, the young men who were um, putting those threats up on those yaks up that were threatening to particular, um, ki you know, kids on campus, they, when they were arrested, they, they felt bad. But the problem is, the, the accountability is, 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 it can't be just the one or two one-off people. It has to be ongoing. And once we get to the place where we're starting to see more of this, I think people do step back for a second. Um, the, what also has happened is that when people lose their jobs, like the situation I was showing earlier, the woman who said something really nasty about um, the young girls, um, the Obama kids, um, Elizabeth, she lost her job, but she was so profusely sorry for what she had said. She said she had reread what she was saying and what she wrote, and then she wanted to apologize. And usually it's not until someone has a reaction back about what they're saying that's negative do they start to realize what, what's happening. And this also happened with the young man who um, put up that picture with the young boy in the background and all his friends was calling the kid a name. He, you know, put up a profile, basically apologizing, but also saying the kid's name is Camden. Um, the, the challenge that we have is the accountability. And there are laws out there. There are, I'm, I'm working with different representatives in different um, states, whether it's state level, whether it's um, federal level, House and Senate. We are looking at better laws 
or ways in which to use the existing laws to hold people accountable. A lot of what's already on the books can be used. We're just not using it. And police just don't know what to do under certain circumstances. And I, the amount of times I've heard from the police, well, it's not real. That threat's not real. But as you saw with a young girl where these guys were actually circling them, that's a real threat. Uh, I, I know that you mentioned that there's no tech fix for human behavior. Yes. Uh, at the same time, my interest in user experience, I'm very interested in the intersection of when you design something and then when you add people to it, and how you can nudge in directions where people behave the way you want them to. So do you have any idea, like, what would you want to see to, like, if you were building something from the ground up, a social media network, to kind of keep people from even going there in the first place, to have to respond to it? Um, Tumblr was one of the platforms that tried to make sure that they kept the community sort of engaged. So that's one example. And they, they did that in a way so that um, people felt comfortable about sharing. Um, some of the choices about these anonymous apps are also allowing people to share things that are happening to them without them being um, victimized again or um, not necessarily given, given away their users' names either, but enough to like, get the story out there so that people know that something needs to be done. But you said something is really important, that, and I want to just um, take a step back and say, the challenge is we operate from building the tech and then nudging the humans. We need to build a tech that's already based on how we are as humans and nudge the tech. I'm done. One more. Uh, so you've described frameworks of individual accountability that are being loosely applied to the people in these situations. Um, in other domains, such as copyright infringement, individual accountability has been extended to the inclinations of the systems themselves. Um, such as, like, if your software is really easy to pirate stuff for, then it's still easy to punish you. Do you think it's realistic to extend harassment um, accountability to the system creators themselves? Yes. Yes. I, I, we have so many, there's been so many debates about who's, who should be responsible. The example with the ICAC that I used earlier, um, the, the designers of ICAC felt that the schools need to handle the situation. The schools were saying that ICAC needs to handle the situation. Um, while in the midst of that, the, 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 the youth on, on their campus is being threatened and they don't feel safe. So the accountability can't just be in one place. We all have to be accountable in some form. So that, to me, is where the challenge is. And I have to go. Because I got... <laughs>